Grace and peace to you. Welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. We're so pleased that you're with us. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Come and see the grace of God. Christ, our teacher and our friend. Come and see the Son of God. Christ, our healer and salvation. God is moving in this place. Come and see. Here in this place the new light is streaming, now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space our fears and our dreamings, brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken, gather us in the blind and the lame, Call to us now, and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of your name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery, we are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. in the rich and the haughty, gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly, give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water, here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters, call us anew to be salt for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion, give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away. Here in this place the new light is shining, now is the kingdom and now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever, gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together, fire of love in our flesh and our bone. Assured that the one who calls us to hear and obey already knows the confessions of our hearts and is ready to forgive. Let us confess our sins before God and one another using our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, you see into each of us and know us fully as creatures in need of your constant care. We confess that we have neither heard your word nor followed your will. We have failed our nation, neighbors, families, friends, and ourselves. Give us ears to hear your wisdom. Lead us to honesty and faith so that we may begin again with renewed strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
hear now our assurance of pardon. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Know this and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This morning we're going to have a reading from Psalm 139. Now this Psalm describes our personal relationship with God. God knows us inside and out. God knows when we're happy and when we're sad. He knows when you have the very best day ever. And God also knows when you are having a crummy day and you just want it to end. God's watching over us and he's thrilled with when things go well for us. And God also feels our pain, knows when we're hurting and feels that hurt as well. He is the beginning and the end. Knowing that God is always with us and knows our every move is a huge comfort. God loves us no matter what and will forgive us when he sees us doing something that isn't very best for us. This is our gift. God is always listening. God wants to hear from us. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we're so thankful that you are here with us through all of the good and the bad times. Help us to remember to come to you for help when we're feeling lost or sad. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. By your Holy Spirit, O oh God, open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to the Holy Word so that it burns within us. Amen. Today's reading is from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from John. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalmist says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. This week I've been thinking about that psalm. I've been thinking about the church's stained glass window that depicts George Washington. That window in the sanctuary reminds us that the history of our nation's founding is intertwined with the history of this congregation. Last week on Wednesday afternoon, a mob attacked the U.S. Capitol at the very time we were recording a worship service in this sanctuary under the benevolent eye of George Washington. Since last Wednesday, I've been wondering about our response as people of faith. 
Some of the rioters identify themselves as Christians and they prayed before they stormed the Capitol. It is so clear that we are a nation divided and people who claim the name Christian hold very different worldviews. So I've been thinking about our call as people of faith in fractious times. I've been thinking about George Washington this past week, about our frayed national bonds, about the peaceful transfer of power, in part because I am a Hamill fan, as in a fan of the musical Hamilton. I've been listening to my Hamilton CD since about 2015, and I finally got to see it on Broadway a year ago. And there's a scene in Act Two of Hamilton that is entitled, One Last Time. And in this scene, President Washington has called Alexander Hamilton into his office to ask him to write one last speech. Thomas Jefferson has resigned from the cabinet and intends to run for president. And he tells Hamilton that he, Washington, will not run again for president. And Hamilton is flabbergasted by this. Why would you not run again? And President Washington tells him he's decided to give a wide-ranging retrospective speech on the occasion of his retirement. He wants to talk about what he's learned. He wants to talk about neutrality. He wants to warn against partisan fighting. He intends to teach the nation how to say goodbye to him so that it can flourish and grow after he's gone. If I say goodbye, the nation learns to move on. It outlives me when I'm gone. Like the scripture says, everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. They'll be safe in the nation we've made. I want to sit under my own vine and fig tree, a moment alone in the shade, at home in the nation we've made. Safe in the nation we've made is a heartbreaking phrase this week. At the founding of our country, people equated George Washington with the country, but he had the wisdom to put the country before personal ambition. In this scene, Washington quotes Micah 4.4, They shall all sit under their own vines and fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In the Hebrew scriptures, the vine and fig tree are a prophetic promise of hope, of messianic hope for a new world. This was hope for a time when the Messiah would make it possible for people to work their own land, to enjoy the fruits of their labors, It was a hope for a time when people could safely rest under the shade of their own trees. A hope for a peaceful life in a just society brought about by the long-awaited Messiah who would set the world right. And so in today's lesson from the Gospel of John, Jesus also references this fig tree from Micah 4.4. There is so much happening in this lesson from John 1. There are so many Hebrew scripture, Old Testament allusions and references. There is this odd conversation between Jesus and Nathaniel. This kind of conversation is a hallmark of John's gospel. In this gospel, Jesus is always having multi-layered conversations with people, whether or not they seem to notice the depth of the conversation. Nathaniel seems to be able to keep up and match words with Jesus. So let's spend a little time in this passage in John 1. I'm kind of a Bible geek, so we're gonna dive in here. Um, One of the things we see in this passage is the use of the word found multiple times. Jesus has found Philip in Bethsaida, says to Philip, follow me. Philip does just that. And Philip then found Nathanael and says, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. So think about that word found and the imagery of Psalm 139 and God searching for us, seeking for us. When Nathanael hears that Jesus comes from Nazareth, he is a forthright soul and he asks quite reasonably, can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
Nazareth at that time was a nothing little town. There are no scriptural prophecies about Nazareth. It's not an important city in the Roman outpost of the Galilee. It's just a little podunk town. Philip is unfazed by Nathaniel's snarky question. All he says is, come and see. Come and see. Come and see for yourself about this person, Jesus. And that's what discipleship is actually all about. Philip is sort of the archetype of a disciple. He meets Jesus. He follows Jesus. He brings other folks to Jesus. It's not that hard. <laughs> this is what evangelism is. It's interesting to note that John is the only gospel that includes Nathaniel in the list of disciples. Here's this really important conversation, and Nathaniel only shows up in this gospel. Nathaniel, Nathanael in Hebrew, means God has given. God has given. And when Jesus sees Nathanael coming toward him, he says this weird thing. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. It's interesting, Jesus seems to know Nathanael already. And this surprises Nathanael, of course. Wait, where did you come to know me? Jesus tells Nathanael, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. There's that fig tree. So there are so many layers of Old Testament themes and imagery that are embedded within this one conversation. There's the fig tree. There's that phrase, Israelite, in whom there is no guile. There's the end of the conversation, angels descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. It's pretty jam-packed, this conversation. An Israelite in whom there is no guile is a direct reference and a pointed contrast to Jacob, the trickster twin who steals Esau's birthright. Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel after a really long night of wrestling with God. Israel. Where did you come to know me? Nathanael asks Jesus. Is Nathanael an upright soul who's waiting expectantly for the Messiah under his fig tree? Is Jesus signaling his divinity to Nathanael by his foreknowledge of his character? Does Nathanael get extra Jesus props for speaking his mind about Nazareth? It's an interesting conversation. And by the end of it, Nathanael has acknowledged Jesus as rabbi, son of God, and king of Israel. All of these key titles from scripture. Jesus tells him, hey, you think it's great that I saw you under the fig tree. You'll understand even more at a later time when heaven is opened and the son of man will be the ladder that bridges the gap between heaven and earth, which is, of course, another reference back to Jacob to his dream of a ladder. So the gospel writer is piling title upon title and reference upon reference to make it crystal clear that Jesus is the one about whom all the prophecies have been written and spoken. The Messiah has been found. And the Messiah is now finding disciples. This conversation with Nathanael is the means by which Jesus' identity is disclosed in the gospel for those who have ears to hear and can connect the dots. I get that's a lot of Bible geekdom, um, but we will be with John quite a bit in the second half of Lent, um, and I want us to have our ears on so that we can see all these things. So Jesus decided to go to Galilee for the express purpose of finding disciples. Jesus went searching for Philip and found him. Philip went searching for Nathanael and found him. Generations of faithful people before them had been seeking the Messiah, and now he has been found. Seeking and finding. Psalm 139 describes the relentless laser beam focus God has in searching us out and in knowing us thoroughly. You hem me in, the psalmist says, and lay your hand upon me. Are there any people 
no matter how angry and involved in dangerous things at the Capitol, are there any people who are beyond the searing, searching, relentless searching of God? Perhaps a faithful response to these fractures and fractured and sad days might be to search for the lost and angry people in our communities, to sit with them under their fig trees, to listen to them, to allow them to be heard and to be known and to hear about their hopes and dreams. Aren't we all yearning to be truly known and loved, even inside our deepest hidden selves? You know when I sit down and when I rise up, the psalmist says to God, you discern my thoughts from far away. And so I'm wondering if this might be part of our call to be peacemakers in this time to seek out those who are lost, to remind them, to embody for them the loving attention of the God who relentlessly searches for us and knows our depths and loves us anyway. God in Christ knows us, knows our inmost hidden selves, and still seeks us out and finds us and hems us in and will not let us go in love. The relentless love of God has sought us out and found us. I wonder if we aren't being pushed to stretch ourselves, to embody that love, to reach out to people that we might not ordinarily choose so that they too might come to recognize God's relentless love in Christ. Amen.
Let us now open our hearts and minds in prayer to God. Ever-present God, you seek us out in every time and place and know us completely. This knowledge is too wonderful for us that each one of us matters so deeply to you. We give you all thanks and praise. Hear now our cares and concerns for the deep pains of our neighbors near and far. Lord of all, we do continue to pray through the aftermath from last week's riot at the Capitol. Our emotions are frayed, our hearts heavy, our minds laden with anxiety and fear over what may come next. The fractures in our nation at times appear unfixable, Lord. Renew our hope that we can find a way forward into wholeness one that does not paper over abuse and injustice in the name of healing, but instead builds the more just order that is the core of any true healing. On this weekend, when we honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., inspire us again to build and to be the beloved community, free at last from the scourge of racism. We pray for the members of the Capitol Police Force who endured such trauma in the line of their duty. Surround them with your compassion and strength, and may they receive the professional and therapeutic support they will need to recover. We lament the tragic loss of Officer Sicknick at the hands of rioters and of Officer Liebengood moved to take his own life, and we pray for their families and loved ones in their grief. We pray, too, for the many others on the ground that day who are also struggling with what happened to them, including members of the media who were attacked, staffers, and members of Congress. We mourn the ever-growing loss of life in this pandemic, the dark records we are setting daily. Over 4,000 people each day gone from this earth, over 4,000 families crushed by grief, over 4,000 communities forever altered. We continue to pray for our healthcare workers who are pouring out their all to hold back the tide of this virus without adequate space to process all of their loss and grief. We pray for the rollout of the vaccine here in New Jersey and around the world. Grease the wheels of our clunky systems, O oh God, so that every available dose can quickly find its way into a person who needs it. We lift to you the strain of these days, the economic hardship, the growing housing crisis as more and more families cannot pay their rent or mortgage, the inequality of access to adequate medical care, the lack of food and resources, the isolation and loneliness, the fear and fatigue, we pray for each person bearing such hardship. More faces than our limited sight can take in, more lives than our limited hearts can comprehend, but each one intimately known and cherished by you. And we pray for those near and dear to us who are facing challenges right now. For Diana, Joyce, Ed, Mary, April, Pat, the family of Sally Colson in their loss, and all those we name before you now. Provide for each as you know they have need, O oh God, and surround them with your peace and love. And now call us once again as your disciples, O oh Christ, and lead us in your ways. Grant us all we need for the journey ahead of us as we join our hearts and voices in the prayer you taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.